Hello everyone, welcome to my observational drawing live stream, which is lesson zero of my observational drawing and watercolour portraiture class, which is opening on Wednesday. And I'm very excited for the lessons to, to finally come out and to have you working along with me. And yeah, I feel like this, the topic of what we're going to be working on today, we're going to focus on the observational drawing side of things. And for some of you, this may be new or it may be a regular practice that you already have. And it's going to be foundational throughout the course because each portrait that we're doing will be starting with observational drawing. And what I mean by observational drawing is that um, I'm going directly from the reference to the paper without putting in too much in the way of structural lines to establish what I'm doing. I'm really observing constantly by eye, measuring by eye. And there are also some, there are some techniques and tools that we can use along the way, which will help us develop this um, ability to be able to, to draw by eye. And I know it's, I, I remember very clearly being very dissatisfied by my work um, drawing by eye and trying out many different methods, many different transfer methods. And sometimes you just want to get started painting. So perhaps you'll use another transfer method where you put your, your drawing onto the paper just so you can get to it. But it's been super satisfying for me and something which I love, which is focusing on the, the drawing side of things as the foundation for doing a longer portrait as well. So that's, that's my thinking behind today's session that we're going to be doing. I'll bring up my workspace and show you a couple of the, the portraits which are going to be part of the class. And we're going to be drawing me today, by the way. So I have some references in the, the there's a link in the description for you to grab those references. And these, I have four of the portraits here that I'll just briefly show you. And each one of these starts with a drawing. And, and there, are, there are many kind of signposts and landmarks along the way as we're looking at the reference, which help us to put things in the right place. So I'm going to start this session with some really basic, basic stuff. And we will, all of these basic things are worthy of practice and of understanding because they lead towards being able to do a confident drawing and just to dive, dive into things. And of course it needs to be practiced and the practice is, um, that's what we're here for. Uh, there's, there's not really a shortcut, but there are things that you can do as you draw that will, that will help you find your way. Um, and I, I have, I have really clear, a few pieces that I've worked on where I just haven't figured out why does it not look like the person I'm trying to draw. And maybe you'll get a likeness, maybe you won't, but, um, just starting to perceive the relationship between different shapes and the distances is uh, a key part to getting a likeness. And it may not be that we get a likeness in, in the early stages, but the constantly looking and reassessing the way we're looking at things is, um, that's how we take our, our baby steps to, to getting there and eventually becoming confident in, in the way we see things and lay down our drawing. Um, for those of you who are in uh, already registered for my class, um, the Zoom room is open for you to, to enter. Uh, the, maybe Kara sent the link around. Um, could someone in Zoom confirm that if you got an email from Kara? I can hear you, yeah. You, oh, brilliant. And I have the Zoom link in it as well. That's good. So if you if you already signed up for the class, you will have an email from Kara, which will have the link to Zoom, because I would really encourage you to ask any questions you may have. Um, and there are going to be a few of these live sessions um, in the coming months, uh, interwoven into the pre-recorded lessons of the course, where we'll be able to get together and you'll be able to directly ask me things. Maybe you'll be struggling with something or just have any question, any, feel free to ask anything. Um, and I will endeavor to explain as best I can and demonstrate um, the things that I'm, I'm talking about. Um, so let's draw a bit. There's, there's a couple of things 
like really, really, um, like really bring it back to basics. Uh, just a couple of exercises I would like to show you. And this is something that I encourage people to do when drawing with pen, uh, but also with pencil, just to, um, just to get confident making clear lines, because I know this is something that a lot of people struggle with. I definitely did. Um, my mentor at the time called them furry lines because they're kind of the searching lines where you're not really sure where you want to put things. Uh, but the, the way in which I work, uh, which owes a lot to having done a lot in ink, is to work with really clear lines. And this is a very, very basic exercise you can do uh, where you have your page. I, for those interested, I'm working on Hanamula Nostalgie paper here. And I have a polychromos pencil. This is pine green. <clears throat> you, can, you can take any page. It doesn't have to be super fancy paper. Uh, it could be any kind of scrap paper just to practice um, the, the way you use your pencil. And I would encourage you also in that, the holding of your pencil, um, not, not to be super tight in like this. Um, for this purpose, I wouldn't be able to show you what I'm doing if I was working like this, but really to, to use your arm and more of your, your body, your hand, your wrist as you're drawing, rather than getting super tight with it. There's a time and a place for getting really on point and getting really careful. Um, but in, in the early stage, uh, it's good to loosen up. And the, even the way you hold the pencil can help you be looser and, and more free in, in your movements. Because um, a lot of people will say, I can't even draw a straight line. And you don't have to be able to draw a straight line. But if you bring more of your, your arm into the movement, that's going to help. So let's just fill this page with lines. And just, just practicing a continuous line is it's a very, very basic thing to do. But just having the confidence to just put a line down and maybe your lines aren't this straight, but it just comes with practice and you can just draw pages and pages. It's a, it's a very kind of low key, low investment <laughs> exercise. But this kind of thing just help to kind of develop the, the movement and the clarity of your movement. And you can go across the page as well and just, just practice putting down lines. Another really beautiful way to, to practice confident line making is um, calligraphy, writing, like doing conscious, consciously writing, <laughs> um, because it's also very intricate line work that we're doing. And you can also go diagonally. And it, it doesn't matter too much what what ends up on this paper, it's just about practicing and moving the lines. And this is, you may not feel like you have to do this all too often. But it's it can be particularly if you're still at the stage where you feel like it's 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 daunting just to draw a straight line, and everyone's been there, I think. Um, doing this kind of thing can really help to just gain confidence and just have the physical experience of um, using more of your your arm to draw, which uh, will really help to get clearer lines. And these aren't very straight, but they, they're straight enough. <laughs> they don't have to be super straight. Um, you can do the same thing with circles. Uh, although some people have pointed out that the way I draw is very angular, um, which I can perhaps get into a bit as, as we work. But because um, circles are really challenging to draw, but you can just like practice uh, putting, putting circles on a page and, and maybe just you could get even looser with it. But a fun thing with doing stuff like this is you can also just put a couple of dots into each one and align and instantly each one becomes a face and they all have their own unique personality. Um, so these are just like fun little exercises just to just to loosen up and just to practice, practice mark, mark making basically, because that's something as we as we start drawing each mark we make um, kind of is, is practice for, for the next one. So that's just super basic stuff that I just wanted to show you. If that is something that you're 
you're not yet f feel very comfortable with or you've never done or seen anything like this before um that that especially if you feel like your lines are all over the place but just doing that kind of thing will help you um have the experience of, of, of drawing lines um and yeah in the chat feel free at any time to put questions in i will um occasionally ask in zoom if anyone has any questions um and if if there's something really pressing feel, feel free to to just speak up as well mark making is relaxing it is it is having having like no real intent or Nothing in particular that we're trying to draw is it's just a, a good exercise. I'm going to drink a little bit. Please ask. Mm -hmm. OK, um, I can try something on Zoom. So I was thinking Zoom is mo mainly for, for talking. Um, but but if I change my camera in, okay, no. Um, if I do this, are, are people is this good in Zoom? Would people like it this way? Okay, <laughs> good. Well, well, this is the way. Everything's good. All right, this is the way it now is. Um, and anyone who joined late, if you are registered for the class, which if you're not yet, you can register at the link in the description. But if you're registered for the class, Kara sent out a link today so you can join me in Zoom and you can ask me questions um, directly into my ears. But if you want to, you can also put them in the chat. And I would love to know in, in the chat on YouTube if you're signed up for the class, um, and you don't have to be, uh, where you are from and what you're drawing with today. And it's going to be fun funny drawing me which is something i haven't done for a while um excellent that's so cool thank you to everyone who's in the class um right so we won't be getting getting into shading and and rendering things today because the way we're working in the class is to start with a, a line drawing and then we filling out the form with the paint so I'm really going to focus on line drawing today and we'll also get into shape mapping. Um, it's sometimes referred to shadow mapping, but it can also be light mapping and just learning to recognize different shapes, which this one, if the was a really, really nice example in the drawing stage where I just had a lot of, a lot of shapes, which I drew to help me into the painting stage, which are not so apparent now, but they're in there and they help me in my decision making process. So as we draw now, um, we'll be focusing on those kind of online work and, and clear shapes. So there are, maybe we'll, I, I chose this picture. So we always have, I have three that we're going to be working on. This is a fairly frontal portrait. I'm not going to get in too much into like the proportions. I, I think most people have probably seen videos where it's like the the head is like five eyes wide and it's like this and all these things that break it down, which is super cool to know. But often we're looking at reference, which is not in that classic frontal position. So learning to look and measure by eye is a, a really um, a helpful thing. It's, it's good to have this understanding of the proportions, but we're focusing on on the looking to, to do our mark making. And maybe actually I'll, to demonstrate a few things here, I, I can draw, this is why I have um, printed out my reference, um, that I can draw straight onto here to show you some things. Um, because there are, there are various helpful ways to, to look at our reference. And one of them, um, just thinking about angles, there's, there's in, in this photo, there's this really clear line coming down here and a kind of not exactly the same angle, but it's, there's another angle here, which is kind of this main shape, like almost like a, a cylinder, which is kind of dominating the, the bottom part of the image. And then we have the angle of the cap. And I know caps, 
there are many things which are notoriously hard to draw, but if we learn to look at things in a certain way, then um, uh, th this way of like measuring the angles and just being being careful with the way we we look at the the different angles and shapes and the way they relate to each other and the distances, um, things become although they are, can be quite complex, um, they become more possible to draw <laughs> and it, it doesn't always work out but um but we can when it doesn't we can start to be like oh what was it that i didn't quite get right and we'll start to notice like on on the peak of a cap there's like this point where things turn around there's there are there are, there are so many little giveaways uh or landmarks that help us and guide us through this drawing process and the more we practice the more it becomes automated that we see and recognize these helpful things along the way. Um, a recurring um, ryth rhythm that we have and angle is like the this the eye line, and it's a really it's a key thing. You can get a really wonky face um, when things aren't in perspective on that 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 kind of rhythm. And here I'm just noticing that there's kind of like a, a exaggerated vanishing point, which is just be off here. And and often the reference image, particularly if it's taken with the phone, will have uh, this wide angle distortion. Um, but just looking, being aware of these things, which frontally would be parallel, um, that if it's not frontal, they exist in this kind of perspective. And um, perceiving that that rhythm to to these lines on that kind of vertical axis that is a really helpful thing to recognize um and then we also have it less so in the um when we're looking horizontally across the face and and in this reference nothing is horizontal <laughs> um yeah, I'll, thinking of what I just drew onto there, I'm going to start my drawing in that fashion here. And then as I go, I will um, elaborate upon things and feel free to ask things. Um, hi, Shannon, Silesh, Roseanne. So, oh, so many people here. Awesome. Uh, Emma, you have um, Noskaligi paper. It's it's really nice paper for drawing on. It's, it's my favorite. Um, Okay, so we, we were practicing these uh, long lines earlier and I have my, my reference very often the same size as my paper, my working surface right next to the drawing. So that helps with a lot of the, the decision making and particularly in the vertical uh, because we can look straight across to, to the reference to see where things are. Um, and each step of the way, uh, feel free to like to take a break or to do whatever you need to do to get things in a way that you're happy with it. But I would also encourage you to just kind of flow with it and go along with what I'm doing and, um, and come back and, and revisit these things and take, take the time you need to, to let this really sink in. Because the more you practice, the more automated these decisions are going to become. Um, usually when I start drawing, I'll just like kind of grab whatever, whatever grabs my attention is what I start with. And I, I really like the, the line on this piece. And I don't usually start just by drawing big, vague shapes, but today I will. Because I think this, there's something about this shape, which is really cool. And I'll, I'll start pretty loose and then I'll start. I'll start tightening things and, and checking the marks that I've made. Um, I have the, the angle of, of the cap here. Oh, and so this is this is a pretty foundational and, and helpful thing to be able to see and do, is that when you're looking at angles, I can remember doing so many where I would... So, so you have the, the straight edge of the paper where you can kind of gauge your angle and distance from and so if I had for example 
if if I had drawn this line over here and then I'm like, oh, there's something not quite right about it, I can look at like, I'm not going to measure the degrees and I really don't think about numbers as I'm drawing, but just to perceive like how many degrees is that out from the edge of the paper and like, oh no, that's like a, um, it's not steep enough, this angle. And just to check with the straight edge, you can see that would be like this, but it's more like this. And then you can, you can carry that line directly across and you can use your, um, your drawing tool as a, as a, a, a helping device, if you like, just to, to bring that angle across. And this is something which caused me so many, particularly with um, like eyes, eyebrows, the, the start of the mouth. I can remember drawing things and being like, I just, I just can't see how to draw this properly. And often it would be just because my angles were too steep or too shallow. And the more you start to become aware of that, then you can catch it as you are drawing and, um, and put things in a place where you feel good with, about them. Um, negative shapes are really cool. So looking at this, this big kind of wedge in here, I can try and re replicate that, that wedge here to help me get things in the right place. So that, um, all of the surrounding forms and shapes and angles, um, negative shapes, but also shapes within shapes, there are all these really helpful things along the way just to help you make decisions of where to put things. Um, and then within that wedge, there's another wedge of where the glasses are coming in. And I'm just looking like how far do I want to take that into where the this interior edge of the cap is to about here. Um, and also the angle. We very rarely have straight lines, but I. I often draw in straight lines and then break it down continually like further into pieces where it becomes more rounded or maybe just has um, angles and is a an angular kind of drawing rather than trying to get get a curve right on the the first the first stroke of the pencil to um to start with a a straight line and then introduce more lines to kind of start working towards a potential curve because just getting a curve right can be really tricky. So it doesn't have to be curved in the beginning. And here I know I can continue this line across like over here. And in this case, I, I do have these, these guiding lines that I put in in the beginning to, to find the shape I wanted to put in. And as I start to feel more confident with where I'm putting my shapes, I can uh, apply a bit more pressure, get a bit more definition. And often in the way I, I work now, I will um, I'll go s straight uh, to applying more pressure because I have um, developed uh, more confidence. Sometimes things still end up looking strange and I want to change things, but the practice of drawing a lot with ink has helped to be a bit more confident from the get-go with my pencil drawing as well. It's interesting with the this arm of the glasses. Um, like if we were to look over here, it's not exactly parallel where the angle that we have here, you can take it across like that, but it's flattening out a bit. And, um, and just noticing those things as we go can be helpful. So I have three references I want to work from. The second one would be more frontal. Um, and uh, often we, we learn in this kind of fr frontal perspective, 
is a, a classic way to kind of start learning portrait drawing. But as soon as things shift from that frontal perspective, um, it's good to just be able to look and see and, and figure things out. And it's challenging, but it's, it's totally worth. It's a fun challenge to, to dive into. Um, an interesting thing with the hairline here is it is, it's, it's quite a soft transition. It's, it's undefined and those kind of things can be kind of tricky to draw. But if we just kind of been, like take a point here and a point here and say, oh, it's kind of like this, just to get the shape down and looking at the, the, the highlight shape here, that, that can kind of help find that edge. Uh -huh, interesting. I've put the the uh, the edge of the nostril a bit far in. Glasses are really great because they're a really clear form, and if you get them about right, you can use them to figure out where other things are. And it's interesting. It looks like I've pushed the nose out a bit far in this direction, so. I can kind of adjust to that. And these are things, the more we get down on the paper, or even in the early stages where there's not much drawn yet, um, each thing that we draw provides that orientation to, to compare and see, okay, where is, where is the next thing compared to this thing and to help put things in the right place. And the eye, for example, using the frame to put things in the right place. It's, if I'm looking here, it's like less, if I were to make quarters of this lens, it's like the, the eye exists in the bottom half and it's going beyond the middle of the, um, the lens of the glasses. So that can often be super helpful just to be like, oh, where, where is the eye actually within the face? And if you've got the glasses, then you can, they can help you with the nose and the eye and the eyebrows. Um, they, they're a very helpful drawing aid. I'm not going to get into all that detail in the beard. You can always choose. Like some references will just be so, may have complexity, which is overwhelming and confusing, but you, you don't have to draw everything. You can simplify things just to kind of suit your purpose. Practicing timed sketching is uh, really helpful for that kind of thing. If you've ever felt like you need a lot of time, if you're even going to bother getting started, um, that's something that can help. Like the idea of simplifying things and also to just give yourself uh, a brief time frame to, to do something in. Um, are there any particular questions in, in regard to what I've talked about so far in this reference? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yes, I'm working on an upright surface. Yeah. If, if the surface was flat, I would hold it like this. Like I, I just switch, I also have a, a surface here. And um, yeah, I, I hold it on this kind of angle a lot if I'm working flat. So because I'm upright, I'm, I'm like this. And often I, the longer, if you have a, a long pencil and you can get pencil extenders when you just have like a little, a little bit left, um, being able to, and this is something that comes a lot from that you can, you can get some really awesome expressive uh, mark making, um, which I'm not going to focus on too much. But um, yeah, 
uh, holding the pencil further back, I feel like um, if you're up, if you're over here, so it, it gets further away from the paper. That's also something that if you're if you lean on the paper, um, oil from your hand will get into the paper, and when you go to paint on it, it won't take as well. So that's another reason not to rest your hand on the paper, or if you do, to have um, like use another piece of paper as a shield to protect the paper, just to do that. But um, so that's like an additional bonus of holding the pencil further away of working like this is that you you don't have to lean on the paper. Um, <clears throat> But yeah, I, I feel like so, sometimes I'm drawing and I feel like it's it's really tight and I it's not working out. And then I just like, oh, I'll just hold the pencil differently. And it instantly I feel like there's a, a different um, approach to the way I I draw when I'm holding it like this compared to this. And I love getting getting into details sometimes and you get in really close. And um, but sometimes I'll, I will start a drawing really tight and then realize, oh, things like if I zoom out a bit and also change my um, the way I'm holding the tool, that can kind of change my mindset into the way I'm looking at the, the image as well. So it's, I find that really interesting um, side effect of holding it this way. So yeah, if you're, on a, if you're working on a horizontal surface, that was a very long answer. <laughs> horizontal surface, you could be holding it like this. Um, because yeah, if you're like trying to draw like this, um, that, that won't work. Yeah, you're welcome. A bit of a, turn into a bit of a rant, a long a train of thought. But yeah, thank you for asking. <laughs> that's, that's good. Um, oh, this is a, this is a good question. Uh, with the beard, how do you see the jaw points? Do you need to? Um, it's just like, it just extends. And here, because there's no, it's like the crop, it could be like a, it could go all the way down to my knees. And it doesn't matter. And that's something people often ask when, during live sessions on Tuesdays. They're like, how long is your beard? And I was like, it's eternal. <laughs> it never ends. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. That, it's an interesting question, but I'm not sure we need to know because we're just, looking at what we see. If there was something distinctive, um, like if it was a, a neatly trimmed beard, then perhaps we would see a jawline. But here it's just kind of just a, a, a chaotic uh, nest of furry beardness. So I don't know, it would maybe be like here, but it doesn't matter. But thank you for asking. Um, all right, I, I didn't want to get, I could talk about the, the peak of the cap. I didn't want to get super detailed with this because I want to do some more stuff. Um, but if you feel like you're feeling good about how this is going, feel free to, to continue uh, at, at a later date or just keep going now and listen to me as I say the things I say. Um, but here I was just thinking, so the peak of the cap, this is a, a flat peak. So it's, um, I know these, like a curved peak can be really a, a challenge to get that curvature right. But here, if we just imagine like a kind of rectangle going out here, and I indicated these points, it's like, okay, it's starting to curve away here, coming to over here, and then we can, within those points, we can draw our line. That's kind of flat. And then and we have similar kind of points over here, just to discern how, how that curve could be, because it can be pretty tricky getting a curve right. And that's something in this case, because it's a flat peak that helps with that. But even if it was, um, no matter how complex a shape is, there are ways to simplify and break it down to make it understandable. Um, and that's the practice that we're kind of getting into of, um, just observing and seeing how things relate to each other to be able to draw them. So all of the drawings that I do in the course are 
um, are drawn onto watercolor paper. And this, uh, I love this paper, but it's it's not it's not really awesome with wet media. Here, I just noticed the neck. I made the neck super short. And these are things when you have your reference right next to you, you can check in. Be like, oh, something looks a bit strange about this. And it it takes practice to like figure out what it is. Um, but you start to catch things like, oh wow, I made my neck like really short, um, just by looking over to the reference here. So that is a tool, a really easy thing to do that if your reference is next to you, you can check in like that. And there are things that people do like when they hold the pencil up at a distance and they're like looking like that to measure. Um, there, are, there are different things to do to help you in different circumstances. Um, and I'll just, as a last thing, kind of briefly indicate what I see here as like a, a shadow shape without doing any rendering, just indicating that there is a shadow shape here. Maybe the, um, the outer edge, I can define that a bit more because it's a bit lost. But yeah, for our, our first portrait drawing, uh, I feel like this is, I feel like this has been good. How's everyone else feel? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll get into this a bit more but these kind of shapes um this like shadow mapping uh where you just use so softer than that there's, there's a hierarchy of line which is also a, a, an important thing to be aware of when you're like how I just realized, oh, the, the edge is kind of lost. I need to, I need to give a bit more attention to the edge, like just putting, getting darker with, with the bolder, more important kind of lines. And then these shapes that I just put in here to indicate where I see a bit of like more shadow um, to keep that really light. So yeah, that's um, perhaps if we were to think back to the line drawing exercise back here, you could also practice getting going from really dark to really light with your lines uh, because um, often I will I do like a, a complete drawing I, I like to use kind of as always and not, not always but often as few tools as possible and the, the range you can just get with one pencil even with like a, a 3b pencil you can get like really busy really soft with it or get really dark and um, yeah, this hierarchy of line where things are really dark too, you can draw them a bit darker, kind of reinforce the, the, the weight and the, the intensity that they have in the, the composition. And as you start to add more and more to a drawing, even within the painting phase, if, if you start to feel like you're losing the definition and you're not really sure what you're looking at anymore, that's what I love about this process and also within the, um, the course that I will, I'll get my drawing started and then I'll paint and then sometimes I feel like, oh, if I draw back into this, I, will, I feel like I'll find my way again. Um, I feel like it's a really helpful thing to be able to do. I think that um, that realization that came with the help of Nicolas Oribe, when I saw him paint uh, drawing into his paintings, I was like, for some reason in my mind, I was like, if it's a painting, it's a painting. And if it's a drawing, it's a drawing. And I would get to a stage in my paintings where I feel like, oh, I've lost the definition and I, I don't really know what I'm looking at here. And, um, and yeah, that was really just helpful to see, see the way he worked and to realize, oh, you can, you can draw on a painting, that's okay. And maybe it even becomes part of the, like a special kind of quality to the, the work that you do. Yeah, so now this edge would have a bit 
like it's it's really soft like with all the hair I, I feel like this would be a stronger edge because there's this uh, from the dark of the hair to the the lighter tone of the skin but although it's not a straight edge just perhaps with uh, some like darker lines and yeah there's all sorts of stuff going on in this space but i'm just not not going to go there for this drawing <laughs> um yeah there we go that's the first drawing hola de gris is da <laughs> um does the size matter that's interesting um drawing big is really cool i don't think it's better but um particularly like with what I was talking about, um, using more of your body for the drawing rather than just getting really, really tight with it. Not that, um, if you're working bigger, then then there's more more movement, um, yeah, more space to move across the paper. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I don't think it's better. Uh, it, it's really cool. Like the bigger, uh, it, it's it's really fun working big. So if you never have, then then definitely try it out. <laughs> oh, cool, Katarina feels like it's easier to work bigger. That's interesting. In the case of um, painting, I feel like when you get bigger, like scaling up the tools. Like I, I really like um, calligraphy pens, and then having a broader, like a broad brush, or if it's a really big surface, then the brushes could just get broader and broader. And it's, it's kind of scaling up of the process, but the way of the way of checking in where you're putting things in relationship to each other um, will remain the same, I think. And they're they're interesting. They're, they're different transfer processes. So this, if I wanted this to be on a wall, then I would have a really different um, transfer process of this, like one to one, looking here, looking there. Um, for murals that I've done recently, I've done a doodle grid, which has helped me to scale up my, my drawings. Um, yes, you can. Thanks, Zan. But yeah, you can. Um, thank you to both of you. Uh, you can download the references at the link in the description. You can also sign up for the class if you haven't yet at the link in the description. Um, okay. So I, w I wanted to look at this one now because this is more of the, the classic frontal kind of reference. Um, and it has, I think, some pretty cool like shadow shapes, really strong lighting from, from above. And this is a... Um, so... I'm part of two reference sharing communities where people share photos of themselves or cool things that they see where they're like, oh, that could be a painting. Or when people notice interesting lighting, they're like, oh, I'll get some photos of this and send it to the reference sharing community. And people have done portraits of, of, of this image. And, um, and part of the practice of, of finding what we like working on or images that really kind of resonate with us when we see it in other people's work, as we start to look at things more and think, oh, what is it about this that I feel is like really compelling? Um, and often having, having interesting light and shadow relationships is a, a really cool thing to have in, in a reference. So um, I actually brightened the shadows of this a bit because my eyes were kind of lost in the shadow. Um, but yeah, just the, if you squint at it, squinting is a great thing to do. Um, then you see these really clear shapes and that can help if we, maybe that would be an interesting way to, to start this because just looking at this big light shape, the, the dome at the top and the way these shadow shapes are is a, um, I guess that, that's what made this image kind of. Um, stand out to me um, and you can all you can let me know in the comments where you find your reference images or what you what you like to work or maybe you don't yet know what you like drawing <laughs> but um, starting to understand what it is about 
on the one hand, it's easier to draw something that has really a clear light and dark contrast because you, there are more, more shapes and things to draw, more to hold on to than like a, a frontal lit flawless face. It's like the hardest thing to draw <laughs> just because there's nothing there, nothing to draw. Bless you. <laughs> And does anyone in Zoom or or YouTube have any questions? So here is, since we have this frontal face, and this is not usually the way I, I will break things down, but it can be very helpful to, to look at things this way. It's like we really clearly have like the top of the glasses um, and this the the vertical rhythm that we have right like here and the eyes, the bottom of the glasses, the nose, the, the, the lips, top of the ears, the, there's all this stuff happening, or even just here, there are all these indications to, to find our way through the, like where, where we want to put everything. And, and if, you, if you want, you can really measure things up, but the more we practice and just by doing it by eye and I can see here that I've already put the glasses like too low. Um, but the more we practice just doing it by eye, um, the, I feel like the, the more the process flows, the, the drawing process. And that was something, um, trying various transfer methods that I, what led to uh, practicing this a, a lot was just that it felt like, even though inaccuracy would become uh, just part and parcel of doing things this way. It's, um, there's a, a flow and also the presence when you're really like attentive, really looking super carefully at what you're drawing, just that kind of the focus that you have when you're trying to puzzle it out by eye becomes a, a really, um, special part of practicing this way. Cool, Emma just said, um, had a hard time starting to draw these last years. Having a set time with live streams like this helps a lot and to have the subject chosen for you. Cool, I'm, I'm glad that is, is helpful. I can remember um, a long, <laughs> many years ago when I had more time to sit around dreaming I had like this um, folder on my computer, which is just called inspiration. And whenever I would find something and it was really a disparate subject matter, but whenever I found an image that I thought looked cool, I would put it in this inspiration folder, thinking that may, oh, that would be cool to draw. That would be cool to paint. Most of the things I never drew or painted, but they, I, put, I put them in a folder. <laughs> And, um, and just that process of curating things, um, I think was interesting just to realize, oh, that, okay, so there are certain things that kind of resonate with me, things when I look at them that um, I feel like compelled to, I obviously didn't feel compelled to draw them because I never got around to doing it. I just thought I would, but um, something that really kind of um, is outstanding in a way. I think that was like pre Instagram, the inspiration folder. Okay. So this is a, a really cool thing. So I was talking about the, the vertical stuff and this is something when you there are all these different head drawing models, which will um, explain how far between things 
And the most useful thing I find as a unit of measurement in the face like this is like to take an eye, um, just to take something within the image. And maybe it's not even a portrait, but if you can find a unit of measurement, which like repeats somewhere throughout the, the drawing, uh, it's, it's often the case and there, there's always variations um, and differences, but often like between the eyes is an eyes dif distance. And then, so if you take your eye as a unit of measurement and be like, okay, how, how many is the, the nose, maybe an eye wide or less or more. Um, and you just start to have like this kind of, uh, a unit of measurement to find your way around things because there are so many, so many subtle distances, which will make such a distant, uh, difference, like between the eyes and the nose and the nose and the mouth there just being out by a few millimeters will really um, affect the likeness a lot and and if you start to if like the eye is even a pretty big unit of measurement but if you can find something like that that can be helpful if, if you're at um if you're like oh something not quite right about this and sometimes then like i can remember drawings i've done on like oh wow like this thing is like way too low and that they could, I could almost fit like another eye in between there. Um, and just having that, uh, that idea of, of a way to measure things can also be, be uh, a helpful tool. Um, and a cool thing, so there, there are a lot less of these kind of uh, landmark. It's not, not as obvious as like the corners of the eye are usually pretty close to the, to, to being in alignment with each other. Um, like different things, different fire. Here we have these lines, which are pretty much almost on a continual um, line here, but using the edge of the nose to find out the relationship to the corner of the eye. And we can't see it very well here, but the corner of the mouth, how that is in relationship to where the pupil is located and the eyes can always be somewhere different. So um, using these things as a guide uh, can be really helpful rather than a set thing of being like the pupils are always where the corner of the mouth is, but um, rather than thinking of it as like a, it's always like that to, to know that it can be like that. And then just to check in how things do line up with each other. Um, can also help you find your way. And here I'm kind of surprised by how low the top of the, the ear is. Um, and sometimes like we're drawing and we might think, oh, we know that the ears are about here. So then we'll, we'll just put them where we think they go. And then it might be like, oh, wow, I've actually, I put, put this facial feature in the default place where I usually put it, but that's not actually where it is in this image. Those kind of things can make a difference too. And sometimes it's really like an automated process that you don't even, don't even realize that you have this automatic kind of compensation of the way you do things. But, um, it can help to kind of catch that and realize that nearly everything is an exception to the rule. That's why I don't, I don't really, it's interesting to hear these things of like breaking down the, um, these units of measurement, how to measure the face, but I've, um, it's not something I like, it, it's good to, to learn it and be aware of it, but, um, but then in practice, just by looking at how things are, is uh, kind of the, the, the way that I, I find myself working. Um, this is all really light still and now I want to emphasize the, the shadow shapes. So to have like a clear distinction between the, the light shape and the shadow shapes. And within 
within the light shapes, there's also like a, a mid-tone kind of shape here, which is interesting. So just like using a soft kind of indication to, to denote where those different values are is something which when it comes to um, it could be rendering a drawing or the watercolor process um, just to know like oh, okay I've, I've already I've already paid attention to that I know that there's something going on there that I want to kind of uh, indicate as I paint and this is the thing of like understanding different or breaking down different values that in the beginning it's it can be really difficult to discern how um, like what's what's actually a shadow what's the midtone what's like the bright brightest bright and the darkest dark is usually like you squint down it's like okay i can i can orient myself to those two polarities um but then it can be tricky finding your way through the um the in between but yeah just putting down these little shapes it, it becomes kind of an an interesting artifact in the the drawing like part of the decision making process just kind of navigating and making it clear to ourselves for the next stage that oh okay there's like there's like a, a mid-tone here or there's a shadow here just putting those shapes in can be interesting and helpful at the same time <laughs> Uh, the shapes that are really like where, where it's much more shadow i'm going to start getting darker with the the line just to like it's interesting here most of the mouth kind of proceeds into the shadow there's like a highlight down here but yeah it's, it's interesting how the mouth kind of exists within the shadow shape Do people have find that they have um, a particular uh, reference or subject matter that they they draw a lot or return to a lot or even a particular pose perhaps? Some skulls, yeah, that's cool. Have you been drawing? Uh, uh, have you drawn another skull since the skull you posted channel? Oh, cool. Cool, cool. No, this is, this is not, no, this is not the blue picture. It's the same person posing for the photo. <laughs> I thought it was it was really interesting when I um, when I started doing these like thirty faces thirty days challenges, which were so cool, uh, still are. Um, but it really it pointed out to me as I saw the references that other teachers uh, or b before I was teaching it see, see the reference other people chose to draw from, and sometimes you're like, oh wow, I would. I would have flown past that if I was looking for reference. Um, but then sometimes it, it's still really interesting to uh, like to get into a, a reference, which is something really untypical for what I would usually choose. And it was kind of through that that I started to realize, oh, there's a real, um, I have this uh, tendency to really like strong shadows and, um, and then, I, yeah. Oh yeah, those are fun. Yeah. 
yeah, and they were super strong, like light and shadow. Uh, so that those are that, those are fun references. Uh, the ten minute portraits of Bob Dylan and Jimi Hendrix that I did. Yeah, those those are such cool references. And even the um, the the June live stream that I did on Wednesday, and I really liked the one of the Baron, and it's such a such an icky uh, <laughs> kind of uh, reference, but it's really strong light and shadow um and that yeah that's really it's interesting to see to become aware of the things which kind of speak to us and what what we're interested in and it's you know it, it can be for everyone different of course um and yeah the thing of having someone else choose the reference can be can be really interesting either it can be like oh yeah you realize, oh, I really like this kind of uh, this choice of image. What is it exactly that I like about it? Um, or when it's like, if you're thinking, I I never would have chosen to draw this. Um, but then still, perhaps, like the, some of those images have been more interesting for me to be like, oh wow, I I've like found something within this, like I, the. There's always something in an image, like there's always something to draw and something to find in there. Um, but sometimes it's uh, sometimes it's challenging to see how, like, how you could work with it in the way that you would make an image that you enjoy. And to try and tickle something, to tease something um, out of an uh, any given image. Sometimes it's really easy, and sometimes you have to like tease it out a bit. <laughs> this has been an interesting process of um, of like adding adding definition to this drawing, like it was super light and then just kind of, um, yeah, getting getting ever darker and more defined, uh, like started with a, a lot of uh, light lines and just to, to get to things like, this would, this would even, this would be an interesting point to start painting from if this was going to be a painting. And then um, it's not, there's still a lot of space to explore within it, but there's a lot of choices or little indicators that are already set up that would be interesting in the painting process as uh, just an indicator of like, oh, I want something there, there. And um, that's that's what we'll get into with our, our further portraits with, with the course. Yes, Stacey, you'll definitely be able to re-watch the live. Yes, yes, for sure. The only thing about the lives that is live only is the Zoom room for the course participants um, and just being able to hang out. And there's a bunch of people here now and with cameras on or off, but just the ability to be able to ask questions if you feel like it, or just to see each other and know that you're there. It's, uh, it's really cool. And what I'm uh, imagining as once the course opens and when we have more live streams um, and Zoom sessions, that if people do have any particular challenges or questions that you would like addressed, that uh, the, the live streams in the chat, but uh, also in the Zoom, if you feel like joining, will be a place to, to hang out and ask anything you would like to ask. Are there any questions at the moment? I feel like I was heavy into it the explaining and like in the first the first portrait and the, the introductory part and now I'm just kind of just kind of drawing. <laughs> that was like the, the foundation. Um,
and then and that really becomes uh, just a question of, of practice 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 and the more practice we get the the more often we get to puzzle an image together see different faces or even the same face many times um, these lines in the background are kind of interesting compositionally <clears throat> Yeah, but it's these um, these ways of. Are there any questions specific to this idea of <clears throat> measuring and drawing, seeing by eye? That's, um, that's a good question. So the question was, um, how often do I suggest like stepping back to look at whether things have been put in the right place? That, that was a good summary, right, Terry? <laughs> um, when I definitely when I feel like something is like way, like, I'm feeling really kind of irritated by something. Like, um, if I'm like, oh, something about this is, is not right. <laughs> um, then, then I really like check in to be like, what could it be? And then I'll start using all these things of being like, okay, is it that there, there are a few recurring, uh, errors that I, I make. And often it's like the, 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 the bottom, the interesting part of the nose. <laughs> Where, where most of the stuff to draw is will be just a little bit too low. Um, and I like have spaced out the distance between the eyes and the nose. I often draw the eyes a bit too small. Um, but sometimes I'll be like, oh, why does it, why does it not look like this person? And that it, it can be really early on because like, you know, sometimes it's like a, a, a two minute portrait or something. So it'll just be like, if it's just something really quick, it doesn't really matter how it turns out, but it's like, oh, what is it about that? that makes it look not like that person and that's my my own kind of personal ambition is to have it look um fairly close to the person i'm trying to draw and depending on where you're at like don't feel burdened by the idea of it looking like that person um just explore but i think to some extent we we want it to look like that person and when i start to notice like something about this is confusing me that would be a time to just kind of look but yeah, maybe just lean back a bit, start to check in like, okay, are things in alignment? It's the corner of the nose. How does that match up with things here? Uh, the distance from the nose to the bottom of the frame of the glasses are. And interestingly, now that I'm looking at it, I'm starting to see inconsistencies between my drawing and, and the reference. And just to, now that I have so much kind of in place, I can see a lot of things that are inconsistent with the reference. Um, but I guess I, d I don't have like a regular thing that I, I think, okay, now that I've done that, I need to step back and have a look. But um, through the process, whenever you notice um, something where it's like, oh, not sure about that, it could be a good opportunity just to pause for a moment and look, why am I not sure? And then maybe you, you can catch something as you're in the process of putting something in its place to be like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Like a, a classic thing as well would be like the mouth or the eyes to notice that they're like a, a mouth, um, a mouth's thickness too deep or too high. Um, and, and these are things that, that can happen. They still happen to me and I've been drawing a lot of faces, but then I'll catch myself being like, oh, wow, that's okay. I need to readjust where that is. Um, and I have, it's a good idea to kind of step back and have a look, particularly if there's some kind of discontent entering your your awareness. Um, if, if you feel like there's something not quite right about it, that's definitely a good time to check what could that be. Um, because I have taken things to a very tight level of completion thinking, um, I'm going to figure it out somehow, it's going to be okay. And then I get finished with it and I'm like, that is totally not that. 
that's that's not that person um in that case it probably would have been good to take a step back a bit earlier and figure it out <laughs> and in in earlier days uh something that i in this particular one particular portrait which i must still have somewhere where i have like three or four different versions of the same portrait um there's like a something about it it was just wasn't working out and it was some really subtle different distance and i ended up taking a photo of my drawing putting it into like photoshop or whatever your image software is and i put it right on my reference and changed the transparency and i was like oh my goodness how could i not see that the eyes are actually there um and i just i just wasn't able to see yet where things were supposed to be and and i feel like the this stuff that i'm talking about the different ways to measure and to check where things are in relation to each other that is something which can prevent that or make that less likely from being the case that if you if you really checking in with things and where they are that that it may not get that far that that that's kind of a the long-term goal <laughs> and it takes it just takes practice uh like kind of refining your ability to perceive these shapes and the way things relate to each other it so the question is how often do i go back and redraw the same reference if i found find it challenging and it is i don't do it so much anymore but there have been times where i have done things again and again and it's actually super helpful and it's really insightful to be like to really get to intimately know the image <clears throat> and and to become aware of like the mistakes that I made in the previous one or the things that I want to change. And then it's a very interesting process to redraw the same reference multiple times because you, you really start to become familiar with it, which is a, a very, very interesting thing to do. It's not something like I haven't done it for a while, but the times I have done it and there've been a few times it has been a very interesting experience. And sometimes, uh, like in a tutorial, I do like a little warm up sketch where I um, maybe do a, a six minute sketch and then do a, a one hour portrait. And just that loose initial drawing, and then I start a completely new drawing. Um, that I've found has been a, an interesting way to get into, into the zone of, of getting ready for something longer. Because something I find when I when I feel like I'm going to do a longer portrait and I have a lot of time, that even though I do practice a lot of quick sketching, I'll just get into this really kind of tight way. I think I've got lots of time, and it's like what I would like to convey in my longer portraits as well is the the sense of looseness and life that my sketches often have, and and I I catch myself when I know that I have more time working in a way where it becomes less loose. So. Um, So starting a longer piece by doing just something really quick, uh, that, that can be a really a great way to have like a fresh, um, a fresh way to start doing a piece. And I know there are some people who like to big oil paintings and stuff and they do like multiple studies and multiple iter iterations of the same painting color studies doing the same painting in different colors to see like what it'll be like if it's like this or like this like in a smaller version um and i'm, I'm always fascinated really interested to see that kind of process and decision making all right this is getting pretty uh like thinking of it in in terms of like i would start painting with this this is like at a really high level of like being ready to to paint with like some of the stuff where i'm 
kind of tightening, adjusting, getting the definition a bit more, that would potentially be something I would do after the paint dries a bit to reestablish some definition. Um, and for now, I feel like maybe it's time to move on. So this is interesting. I feel like there's this very um, Santa vibe to it with the, the white uh, beard, which I, I just want to make it dark, but I'm, I'm going to leave it like this for now. <laughs> um, this would be a wonderful time to ask questions if people have any. Um, oh yeah, this is really interesting, Emma. I, I've, I've done this and it, it, it's super helpful. Even just like taking a photo of your, of your drawing or painting and then seeing it on the phone instead of on the, the actual work surface, seeing like a smaller version of it, like that can really, that's like stepping back as well that um, you just see a smaller image and maybe something will become obvious in that kind of compressed view that be like, oh, that's that's like tilting off to this side and I didn't realize. Or so yeah, looking at the phone or a camera can be really interesting. And yeah, swiping between the different process stages. Uh, that's, a, that's really interesting too. <laughs> How do you decide that a sketch is done? Usually I set a time limit <laughs> and um, I'd be like, all right, this is going to be a 10 minute sketch. And then sometimes I'd be like, oh, I want a little bit more. And I'll do a little bit more. But um, that is a good question. When is, when is anything done? Time limits help. Uh, yeah, I have one more selfie for us to work from. And this is interesting because it, um, it was taken moments after the, the last reference. <clears throat> but it's a because my head is like tilted back it's a more complex angle and it's interesting having the shadow shape of the glasses in here so there's some um, even though it's a similar image there are very different shapes involved and different rate it's it's like it's similar but it's completely new <laughs> because there's um i'll just just come over here we've got uh, like I looked at earlier. I wonder if the white pencil is any good here. Um, I have not found much that this white pencil is good for. <laughs> it has to be like a really dark. No, I can't see that very well. Um, so thinking of the perspective, like this is a really clear kind of line that we've got going through here. And then Just wondering like how it's not totally parallel with the mouth I would, but it could be it could be pretty close um but just noticing are things are things truly parallel or is there is there a, a bit of a like distortion and perspective because of the lens like here my my ear looks tiny and i know that this is like a, a phone lens issue <clears throat> if you wanted you could make the scale the ear up a bit Make it look a bit more real like could maybe make it go down to here and just make the whole ear bigger um, but this is part of the thing of like the the inbuilt error of perception that a lens has which is different to our understanding of the way things actually are um, and i can't see the other side of the ear but just just kind of looking like what things do i have here how strong is the the distorted perspective and it's interesting to notice it's much less than in from the perspective which was on this one, which went like from from here to here. So just being aware of that can be interesting. Um, and then this really cool, this little highlight here is is so cool. Whereas the other one, the, the last one all of the information of my eyes so much it was just lost in the shadow um but having that little highlight there this really cool shape so there's it's more of a complex pose and there's some more more complex light and shadow shapes in there so i think this would be really interesting to draw um oh and an interesting thing i noticed in this one there's this thing of The way that we find alignment 
this might be, this might be a strange place to start a drawing, but it's just something that I noticed with this image. Is how something that can help put things in the right place is as well as finding alignments of the way things align and we're like if we're looking in the the vertical axis here we can see the corner of the eye would kind of be lining up with what's maybe the corner of the mouth here and just the way things are share kind of an alignment on a particular axis but there's also this thing of like continued uh, lines, implied lines. So even though the the frame of the glasses here is it's kind of it's pointing towards the edge of the mustache here. These kind of things, if if we start to notice these, these can be really interesting. Or there's like the the arch of the eyebrow, and you can imagine there's almost this implied arch across here. We don't draw all of it, but there is this line which is continuing and wrapping around the the glasses frame just Im imagining the extension of that line coming down to the edge of the moustache here and on the other side it would perhaps be similar and and often particularly if th there's a lot of information there's a lot to draw and and go by in this image but often when there is little detail that we may have a more um if it's something front lit or the, there's less detail in the face to go by it can be really tricky to be like where do i put the corner of the mouth or where do i put a particular feature especially when the, it's a, an unusual kind of perspective and if you can find these kind of somewhere it may not even be in the face it may be something in the background but some kind of indicating line which is like this line kind of extends invisibly out towards this shape. Those kind of things can be interesting to notice and helpful for putting things in the right place. That was something that kind of jumped out at me in this image. So maybe I'll start there. <laughs> um, and yeah, this is this is not like putting down all these lines every time, this is not something I would usually do because eventually any any kind of um, supporting uh, helpful tool that we have along the way um, to realize what is it in aid of, uh, what am I working towards? And, and there was a time like when I, I did a lot of portraits where I used a, a grid, a dot grid, which I, because I decided, okay, I want to focus on the painting. I don't want to spend so much time focusing on the drawing for this particular project I was working on. And so I was like, okay, this grid is like, this is just going to help me get things in the right place so I can start painting. And, and I realized that for a time, this is the support, the, that I'm, I'm using to a to a particular end but with the knowledge that one day i would like to just be able to whip out like just go straight to the drawing without such a stiff process of like making a grid and stuff um so whatever it is that we use whether it's like these extending lines if you if it helps you to put lots of lines down to put like how how are things in relation to each other if that's going to help you put them um in a place that feels good on your drawing, then totally like feel free to do it. Um, but it's generally, this is no longer like the way I would work. Uh, not sure if it has been a lot, but when I know when I see it in people's drawings, see a lot of like construction lines, these decision-making lines to help put things in the right place is often something that I, is really interesting to see because there are like using these lines to put things on a certain axis or to put them in the right place, like it, it can be a really helpful tool. So I would say feel free to use any helpful tool that 
that can assist you in getting making an image that you find interesting to make and to look at. My camera's hardly picking this up, so I'll just have to make this a lot darker. And it makes total sense. Um, like I, I rarely erase unless I have really put something in the wrong place and I realize it and I'm like, oh, I'll try and get rid of that. But I often work with colored pencils these days and then you can't completely get rid of it. Uh, so working lighter and then re like reinforcing it, g going darker and, and building, building up the definition is a, a good way to go about it, especially if um, you're not quite sure yet where you want to put things. If you if you really want to push this kind of observational drawing, I would strongly recommend doing ink drawing, whether it's with a pen or a brush, any any kind of ink. It really forces you to um, pay attention to what you're doing, <laughs> to go like full intensity with from the first mark onwards. And that's a it's a great thing to with the subtlety of of using pencil. Um, but it's really, it's just so interesting, just like noticing what is the angle of the side of my face here. Um, so, so that subtlety and the, the ability to do these like soft, uh, soft things that you can do with a pencil, um, is great on one hand, but if you want to, if you're interested in pushing the decisiveness of your mark making, then ink is really great. So there's really interesting stuff happening in the glasses frame. I feel like I've made it a bit small. Um, there's often some distortion at the edge of glasses at the side of the face, and I, I really like how it breaks up the the profile of the face that you have this interesting little window and it's often just like you would have this continuation of the line but it's just like step it in a bit and and i i love that kind of quirky distortion in glasses how's everyone doing <laughs> well that's good that's good to hear <laughs> better than before is good mm. yeah yeah I, I um there are definitely inky ways to work with with it yeah 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 Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm really interested to see. Uh, it's always great to see the the work that people put into to tutorials, and I, I. I'm yeah, really curious if if people see. Uh, what people notice is different in, in in their work, and I hope just just the opportunity to to have a guided practice and um, to have some really awesome references chosen for you. <laughs> I'm super excited about the the references that we work from. Wonderful people and wonderful photos. Cool. I wonder if anyone's already. Uh, working on them. <laughs>
<laughs> so I have um, I haven't really given much thought yet. It was interesting um, when I did the giveaway live stream asking about the the rhythm, like what people feel like would be a good rhythm to do it in. Because once the once the classes are out, people can do it at their own rhythm. I would not. Like maybe some people have a lot of time and are super motivated and just going to like plow through them. But that's not the way that I would do it. Um, but if people want to, go for it. Um, but yeah, don't feel pressure to, to go through the lessons at any particular speed. But um, yeah, to keep just keep going at it. There is something nice about doing things at the same time as other people and being able to be like, oh, yeah, that one was like that for me. And oh, that was interesting how you did that in that because that was tricky or uh, that's that's cool. But um, so there's something cool about doing it together that I would say everyone should definitely feel like they're comfortable with their pacing and also don't feel like seeing other people racing through it, that they're not doing it fast enough. I encourage everyone to feel at ease with whatever tempo they have. Um, yeah, here this light shape, these highlights. This is this is interesting, so interesting. Just this frame of within this part. It's like the frame of the glasses is like a mini composition. And and just figuring out where things exist with it within that uh, manufactured hard shape. That's like this little window and just seeing where things are within it. It's a really interesting. I, I feel like it's super, it's just super helpful. And I do know, um, I, I've had the feedback that a lot of people who have felt really challenged by drawing glasses have um, have come to love love them, seeing them as a as a tool for being able to um, put things in their place. So always spending a, uh, a lot of time having having a lot of like focus on the reference image, always like constantly looking, okay, so how does this edge of the nose, how is that with the nostril? And I put this line up here. So how is that now, the shadow shape interacting with that line and where the, the nostril sits and um, how high is this nostril? If I was looking at it really, there's like this autocorrect feature, which I know that I have, and I'm sure many other people do, that when you're drawing something which is tilted, you kind of flatten it out. And it's so often the case that even though I'm aware that I do this, I'll be partway into a drawing, it's like, oh, I've, I've flattened everything out. <laughs> um, so just like noticing the top of this nostril is uh, like at the corner of this nostril, much lower than this one. And just like kind of noticing that and putting being able to put things in place like that. It's, the, it's like this constant process with each finding the place for each shape and how it relates to, to others. There's this really subtle indication of the, the top lip here. Um, just like this little highlight in there. And like just finding that point, that can be helpful. How is that in alignment with this nostril and So things can be um, even alarmingly complex uh, images, uh, but as you start to see that there are so many things in there which are going to help us find our, our way through, like st starting with bigger shapes and then within that, these smaller shapes, these like up in the eye, these different light and shadow shapes, the way they interrelate, like looking at that, that light shape here, and 
without having to give anything a name or even understand what's going on. You can just look at the way shapes are relating with each other. Having an anatomical understanding is a wonderful thing. But we can also just appreciate the the relationship of shapes. I, I think I think we can. That's you may disagree, but I think we can. <laughs> no, understanding anatomy is awesome. I, it, it generally is. I, I'm, I'm not trying to appease anyone. It's it's so cool, but it is also possible just to look at a thing and draw it. There is um. There is a. It can be really enriching to understand all of the different things that are going on and understanding our bodies is a, a very cool understanding to develop. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad you're appeased. That's not. <laughs> um, I don't feel like I had to appease you because I genuinely think it is cool. <laughs> but I'm. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Anatomy and anatomy versus just looking. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Oh. <laughs> they do. They do. And, and and grids also make it um, easy to put things in the right place, and it's helpful. Um, I'm just thinking about this ear. I'm going to make it bigger than it is in the reference, like I indicated here, because it's. I'm looking at. It, I'm just like that's a that is a little ear, <laughs> and I know. Just from touching my own face, that my ears are much bigger than that. And if you catch these things, because this happens a lot with these, super wide angle, tiny little lenses, um, often people have like a big nose and maybe even no ears, depending on how close they are to it. If there's a bit of an ear and you notice, then you can, with your knowledge of anatomy and knowing that ears, ears are bigger than they look here, then you can be like, oh, I can, I can use my anatomical understanding and knowledge to actually just uh, Conversate and make this look more like my ear should look. From this chromatic aberration. Oh, good one. Yeah. Aha. So. Uh, I think Emma had to leave, but maybe you'll come back, Emma. But Shannon's just saying a knowledge of anatomy would have been really good for that question of where is my jawline under the beard? Um, anatomy could could help you know. Then you you could shave me in your in in your drawing, yeah, in, in your drawing you could draw a shaved me if you under, understood anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> Kira just asked me yesterday and she was like are you attached to your beard I was like it's attached to me <laughs> uh, <laughs> and everyone starts crying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I I have no inclination to. To shave, I've never.
<laughs> yeah, yeah. And then they change their profile picture in real life, but just by, by having a jawline. <laughs> hey, Gretchen. Great. Yeah. Spending too long drawing. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. That when Louise is here with her pigeons, that I also tell her it's... Uh, they're in need of attention, or Barbara's cats. <laughs> Just uh... Yeah, yeah. Ah, a decoy. It, it feels kind of strange not not rendering, hatching anything. But it's an interesting exercise just to do, to try and communicate um, light and shadow just by using like this, this idea of a line hierarchy. Because um, if you can, if you can make it really clear just within the the line work of a drawing, then um, then you've already set yourself up really well if you're going to be painting into it. Um, and because of the way we'll be using watercolor in the course, and that it's a a transparent medium, um, the the drawing really is an integral part of the the portrait and depending on how how dark it gets with the the painting um you still see still see a lot of the the drawing so being able to have a a clear and strong drawing as the foundation of the the portrait is really it's not it's more than just a preliminary drawing because it's it's part of the finished portrait. And the portrait is relying upon the, the line work for its definition and And so the the main thing I feel like I wanted to convey was just like this in the beginning, this really it's fairly basic fundamental stuff of the the way we kind of measure and look at things. And it just it's recurs all the way through our drawing practice. And then it just becomes rather than the focal point at some stage, it just becomes part of the like the steps that we take when we uh, Um, starting a drawing. And if there is any specific question anyone has, or any recurring challenge in your drawing, um, or anything you would like me to address, please ask. Because now I mostly feel like 
I've put things in the right place. And now it's the question of um, how, how dark, uh, how, how much definition I, I give to the drawing. Whether I choose to draw this double on top of my head or not. If you are sharing your work on any social media, I would love you to tag me and I can uh, reshare it and see it. And you can use the hashtag drawing with Dylan. Um, if you're, I'm at Dylan underscore Sarah on Instagram, on TikTok at Dylan Sarah Draws, uh, YouTube at Dylan Saro with no underscore. And um, and if you're if you're signed up for the course, there is a Facebook group which is I can't exactly remember the name of it. There is because the classes are hosted wonderfully with the Cairo Bullock Art School. And there is a Cairo Bullock Art Community Facebook group. Uh, but there is a specific group for my classes. So it was the, if you did my calligraphy pen portraiture class, it's the same Facebook group. Um, but if you're just joining for this and you would like to have a place to, to share and connect, the Facebook group will be active for the class. Oh, cool, cool. That was super fun. That, um, quite... Oh yeah, awesome, awesome. That's so cool to see. I love it. Uh, Lewis. Yeah, nice. Yeah, the zines is it's super cool. That was fun in the calligraphy pen one that it was directly it's it's all on the zine, which is a bit different with the watercolor one, but we still make a zine, which is going to be really cool. Love to see if um if people were getting theirs printed as well. Yeah, that was really fun and, and quite a different process with the calligraphy pen portraiture because it's 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 so direct and that what i was talking about earlier and practicing in ink how that can really um it really gets you looking and making your marks in a very uh, particular way that's a really great way to practice so this is the first time i'm taking my eraser to a drawing but i've got this highlight above the eye and even though there's no darkness in the shadow. I just want that highlight to be a bit clearer. Ruth, can't wait for the class to start as well. That's awesome. Um, ha ha, this is an interesting question. Uh, Katarina, what kind of light do I use? This is a 5000 Kelvin globe. I have two of these lights, but since I'm, um, since I changed my workspace to standing, I can't use the second one. And I have one of these, or two of these. Uh, desk lamps um, so it's like a posable lamp you can see here <laughs> and this is um, an LED non-flickering globe if you're going to be recording anything it's important for it to be a non-flickering globe because some LEDs if you're recording you get these weird weird things happening with your light um, yeah and 5000 Kelvin is like a a cool neutral bright it says like a daylight light um, these are the lights that I have here Well, 
outcome. What isn't a recurring challenge would be a shorter list. Right, I I feel like for with the mindset that this would be the the drawing for um starting a painting, uh, I feel like I'm getting getting to the stage where like I would feel like I could start painting into this. Um but looking at it purely as a drawing, I I I see there's still a lot to do. <laughs> But for the purpose of today's um, practice and just to kind of uh, give you that initial impulse into this way of doing observational drawing. Uh, if you want to practice before Wednesday, before the, the classes are alive and ready to watch, then perhaps there are some things that have addressed through these portraits that you can incorporate into your practice and, and be aware of. And I particularly, I feel like the first one was actually super informative and helpful because it had such strong angles and like seeing negative shapes, finding where you put these angles and stuff. I feel like that was, uh, there's a lot of really interesting, helpful stuff in here. Just getting able to have, have like a, an angle be the correct angle can, that, that already makes such an impact on the way things relate with each other through throughout the image and so long as we're working like we we put something somewhere and we start to use that as the the kind of the piece of the puzzle before our next step and everything starts to relate to that and there's in that way of working there is potentially like this inbuilt error which things will continue being a bit more quirky as we go but that can be like a really fun result when it's like you're using something as your frame of reference but that's a bit off but it's still within the image it can it can just be a cohesive cool drawing um yeah and just finding these different pieces putting them where you want them then finding your way around um I, I find like it's a really fun way of, of putting the puzzle of making an image together. Um, so it was about, we started with line and just practicing having like uh, doing clear, decisive lines. And and th throughout this, I have started with soft line work and, and gotten darker. But that practice of being able to put in like a, a nice strong line is, uh, is really helpful. Um, and me measuring by eye and if you can find something as a unit of measurement it's potentially helpful like the eyes as a user unit of measurement i touched upon in this frontal portrait um but every every piece we put in place is going to help us like if you really pay special attention and maybe like um terry suggested stepping back or asking how, how often is good to kind of step back and check in with things the more you kind of look like Okay, the ears, uh, and probably now as I start looking, I will notice like inconsistencies a lot more with my drawing and the reference, but that's okay. Um, but like how are the ears in relation to the frame of the glasses and this this like wedge of the, the light shape coming up here, like what kind of angles does that have and the, the spacing of that. And just constantly looking at within each little piece of, of the greater composition. That's like, how are the things relating to each other in here? And then you can like reach across, like you're just using these pieces of information here. And it's like, okay, where is this? Where is the second ear in relationship to that? And there's, so there's, we can kind of zoom in and zoom out in a way of like shape finding and finding the way that lines and angles, uh, um, how the relationship between them fits together to to put things in the right place. And that's what I, um, yeah, finding alignment as well, that we have the, like the horizontal, uh, or the vertical rhythm and the horizontal alignment, and also finding the way things are lined up, um, just to be able to like look through an image and see where's the corner of the eye in relation to the nose and the corner of the mouth and 
where the hair comes down here, like there are these all the way through this axis, we can start to find things that are kind of in alignment with each other and that that can be helpful. Um, yeah, and then looking at looking at the shapes, the the big shapes, the light shapes and shadow shapes, um, looking at things in terms of negative spaces and um, I think those are, those are all of the things I wanted to talk about in this session. <laughs> so I hope that has been helpful for you. Um, <laughs> that's really good, Lydia. Draw what you see, not what you think you see. If you don't see a draw line, don't, don't make it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and that's often, I, I think it, so often it can come, come back to that where it's like, oh, this is really complex. How am I going to do that? And just like bit by bit, like, okay, the ear is really complex, but if we just focus on like, what is the outside shape like? What is it like within that shape? And how does that relate? Each thing can be broken down into like smaller, less overwhelming uh, pieces of information. Yeah, and if it's not on there, um, and you really want it on there, um, then perhaps if, you, if you're able to get your own reference or you can like combine different references, I've done that sometimes with images, where like, this would be cool if I could like see that over there and it was a bit more like that than like combining different images to to have like a, um, just to have something to draw upon from, from your reference rather than making things up, which can then look um, look a bit made up. <laughs> uh... Rebecca, yes, on YouTube, you can't hear the other side of the conversation. For the live streams, which I'll be doing, which are interwoven with the observational portraiture, observational drawing and watercolor portraiture course, which is starting on Wednesday. You can sign up at the link in the description. Um, I have Zoom open for the class participants and those are the people that I'm speaking to. And for future um, live sessions, there will be emails sent out with the, the Zoom link. And you can also subscribe to my um, mailing list, which is in the description. Uh, if you'd like to be informed of other opportunities to draw with me. Um, will you get an invite to the Facebook group? Uh, maybe, maybe that will be coming because I'm not sure. I'll, I'll definitely talk to Kara about it. Um, but may, maybe that will kind of be happening when the classes go live. So, but yeah, I'll ask Kara, and I'm sure she will, she'll be able to send all the participants uh, an email with the link to the Facebook group, because it would be great to have you in there. Um, great to have you sharing your work as well. <clears throat> um, yeah, did you get an invitation? Okay, cool. So in the class website, there is a link to the Facebook group. So check that out. Um, do I use black and white or color reference photos in your course or a mixture? A mixture. Uh, there, and also, uh, I don't have it here. I have it on the wall over there. But we start with a black and white image and we work just with purple and yellow when we start painting, which is totally uh, not <laughs> like unrealistic colors, but looking at things in that, that tonal way. So like kind of like here, um, there are a couple of times that we work with black and white or almost black and white images. And then it's, it becomes like a playground for like, you can use whatever color you want. You just focus on the value. And the way the course is structured is I start with um, a, a reduced way of painting with less colors and and then get into to more complex using many different colors. And, um, and then at some point also go back to a black and white image again, just to really get loose and free with that exploration of color. So yeah, it's both. And here are, um, here are some of the, the images which I had up earlier as well. Um, and I, I really like a lot of the paintings that I did for the class. It's, um, it was really cool putting it all together. So I'm super excited to have, have you watching the lessons and um, yeah, for it, for, yeah, please ask.
Um, that is a good question. These are not painted in the scene because of their watercolor and watercolor needs its own paper um, because it's a, a wet medium and it'll get really warped. And in, a, in the zine, um, because co compared to the calligraphy pen portraiture zine, it's um, spending a lot more time with the images. And then th there's a thing where, when you're working on one piece of paper to be like, oh, I hope this is like, I hope I'm not going to wreck it, everything I've done so far. This, and, and that's an important part of the process as well, just to be like comfortable with the, the, the way you're working with things. But these are all painted individually. And this is, how big is this? Like this big, <laughs> uh, as big as my head. Um, it's slightly larger than A5. Um, and then I photograph them to put them together in a zine. So that's the, like the bonus part of the class is that we'll be photographing them, putting them together in a PDF, which you'll be able to get printed to make your own zines. Um, but yeah, yeah. So they are not, drawn directly into a zine. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Ruth, StreamYard is money. <laughs> this is not instead of Zoom. Um, I have Zoom as well. I have Zoom open parallel to StreamYard and I am paying to use StreamYard. That is true. Um, so anyone who wants to support my live streaming can also sign up to my Patreon. And um, there's a link to that in the description as well. StreamYard, StreamYard is a live streaming platform. Um, and I, I use a, it's, it's really good when I have guests on this, this format of streaming that I can do um, with OBS, um, which is an open source uh, free software. But when there are many camera feeds and guests coming into the live stream, StreamYard makes it um, streamlined and user friendly to, to have guests on. So that's why I use StreamYard. Yeah. Um, all right. I think that looks like all the questions in the chat. Thank you everyone so much for being here. And I'd love to see your drawings. So if you're posting them, please tag me. And. Um, have fun Wednesday when the class opens and they I'll let you know when the next live stream will be. I am thinking it, it probably won't be the Easter weekend, but the weekend after that, perhaps we'll have the next live stream. So once people have started watching the classes, uh, which looks like that will be, uh, yeah, the sixth, I put it in my calendar, the sixth of April. <laughs> Um, we'll, we'll do another live stream and then we'll get into the watercolor. Any specific questions people have on the watercolor in the cl classes thus far, we will address in the next session. Uh, cool. Thanks for being here, everyone. Uh, have fun with the lessons. I can't wait to see what everyone makes. And um, thank you for drawing along. We'll see you next time.